We're here to tell you what we do and how we do it. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about statistics because uh, I like numbers. I have a thing for uh, statistics. And then Ms. Komar is going to tell you about how we respond as a board. And a lot of the information that we're going to present in terms of the numbers that we're dealing with deal specifically with the population of uh, uh, students attending the Greater Essex County District School Board. So we're talking on average, we're talking about 36,000 students that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Both in, We deal with uh, 36,000 students both in our uh, throughout our elementary and high school panel, both in the city and in the county. So when we look at it, we've been, uh, this year is the first year we've really been uh, gathering statistics, looking at the number of students that we're responding to on a daily basis. And uh, I want to share some of those with you tonight. Let's see, okay. Uh, again, when we're looking at, I thought, Vicki, did you, had you done this first slide or you want me to do it? Okay. What, what is a crisis? What, do, what is it that we respond to? And certainly what we do uh, respond to are threats of suicide that are made by students. And sometimes when we think about suicide or threats of suicide, we're often thinking about teenagers. But we're also dealing with this, as you'll see from the numbers, we're dealing with it in the elementary panel as well. So we're dealing with students as young as grade two making comments about wanting to harm themselves or wishing that they were dead. We're also obviously dealing with students who may attempt suicide, also expressing thoughts of self-harm or suicidal ideation, and also engaging in behaviors of self-harm. And a lot of times when we're talking about behaviors of self-harm, the ones that really come to mind are the cutting behaviors. And I think that's been in the media quite uh, recently. I think there was, there's a whole thing on the web cut for Justin, right? Because they want him to stop doing something. So they're, they're going to you know, say, uh, we'll do this behavior if you stop what you're doing. So we're seeing a more and more increasing frequency in terms of the number of kids, both males and females, who are engaging in self-harm uh, self behaviors. When we look at the, the number of students involved, what you have here on, on the graph is our statistics for the Greater Essex Board from this school year, stemming from September all the way through to the March period. What we're seeing is obviously, uh, there's a couple things happening in here. One is that we're seeing an increase in the number of cases we're dealing with. And I don't think it's necessarily the case, oh, sorry, I keep walking. You want me in the light again, don't you, sir? Um, it, it's not just the case that we're seeing kids going into more and more distress over time. I think part of what it is, is it's an educational program. In other words, we're making our staff and parents and administrators more and more aware of when kids are how to spot kids in crisis. So we're seeing an increase in the number of calls that we're getting. And, and administrators are asking our team to come out to evaluate and assess the situation so that we're making some judgments. So you can see, though, um, as of March, we uh, actually hit over 80 to eight, or 84 cases that we're dealing with. So when you break that down and you think of a, a month, and March was a short month for us because it was March break, so we only had three school weeks. So when you think about that, that's 15 school days. So in those 15 school days, you're dealing with a, at least five crises on, on a daily basis. And we've been examining the information, again, in terms of is it happening more often in high school or grade school? And in fact, when you look at the information, uh, we're seeing it, it's pretty even, except for the month of March, where it seems that the grade school kids are outnumbering the high school children, uh, high school students. I'm not quite sure why that is. Well, certainly, we're going to be partnering with different researchers to kind of evaluate this in, a, in more in depth. Uh, manner, but you can see it, it happens both in high school and in grade school. We've also begun to analyze it or evaluate uh, our, our statistics by gender. And we are seeing a little bit of a gender difference uh, where uh, females outnumber, are outnumbering males at this point in time, but certainly the st statistics are pretty significant both for males and females. I think um, what happens is what we're, I think we're seeing is a lot of times when we're being involved, uh, it's the uh, females peer group that sometimes are bringing to our attention their concern about one of their friends. And so there's, they're, they're approaching the administrator or their classroom teacher and saying, you know, on the weekend, I got a text from. And so a lot of the things that we're seeing are happening 
via text messaging, that uh, students are making statements and threats uh, via text messaging, and, and that's really um, distressing for students, especially when you're getting a text at 2 a.m. in the morning, and your friend's saying, I wish I was dead, I think I'm gonna kill myself. And so, you know, as a student, what do you do with that, right? You, you don't go back to sleep very easily, right? And then a lot of times what the, we're, we're advising, and we're, the social work department at our uh, board are doing presentations and workshops throughout the system telling kids, what do you do? Don't keep it a secret. Who can you tell? Who do you bring it uh, to attention? All right? So you can see we are um, responding to what's happening, and we have a great partnership with uh, our mental health providers in the community, including Maryvale and the Winter uh, Regional Children's Center. I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Komar, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about what the response team model actually looks like. Yep. Okay, so how we have it set up within our board is, um, as Phil was mentioning, is new this year. And what was happening in the past was um, we would get a crisis call, and whether it's psych services or social workers, they're aligned to a number of schools. So if they were called to a crisis, they'd have to pack everything up, go deal with it, and whatever they were supposed to be doing at that particular school, they weren't able to respond because they had to deal with the crisis. Um, so this year what, what happened was we took all the schools in the system and Phil is responsible for half and I'm responsible for the other half. So whenever it's brought to the attention of the school administration that there is a concern regarding any type of um, potential risk or crisis to a particular student, they call us, we have a consultation with them, and then we, we make a decision. So in some circumstances we may not send out a member of the crisis team. However, in the majority, because our administrators are getting really good at which cases um, warrant that type of support, they're contacting us. We will deploy one of two um, crisis workers that we have. So both of the individuals on the team, it's, it's 1.5 um, FTEs, are both social workers from my team. And um, they would respond to the particular crisis, they would make a decision around assessment and then make decisions about next steps. So in some circumstances, it may be that they've done the assessment and they communicate with the parent, communicate with the school, and no further service is required. It could be that they connect with the family, they make a decision to um, connect the student to a community partner, for example, Teen Health Center, or the walk-in clinic at RCC. And in other circumstances, it warrants um, consultation with the emergency room um, at the hospital. Now for us, we have students who are 16 and 17 years old, and that means if we're sending them to hospital, they're going to hotel due. If we are in a situation where they are under 16, then we are working with our community partner at Met Hospital. Um, Matt's gonna give you a lot more detail about what happens when we um, send a student to the hospital. And this partnership is extremely important because it's not just about accessing that support, at any level, whether it's a community partner in terms of Teen Health Center or whether it's the actual services through the hospital because we want to be able to support that student when they're back in our building, whether it's the next day or a few days down the road. We want to make sure that um, whatever is determined is needed for that particular student, we can support at the school level as well. Matt? Emergency room. So if someone ends up at the emergency room, it's, I guess, best to think of it in terms of the medical model. If you go to the emergency room with a sore foot, the triage nurse is gonna direct you towards whatever diagnostic and treatment ref, uh, resources are there at the hospital. If you come in in a mental health crisis or something that looks like it, the triage nurse is gonna bring in the pediatric crisis team from the Children's Center. Um, and then their social worker is gonna do a brief assessment with the child and family and really try and determine what type of services are, are needed or, or what's gonna work best. Um, there are situations where children are gonna be discharged home from the hospital, and again, that information is, is gonna be conveyed back um, to the school, and typically that's gonna be by parent or by the children's center. Um, if the on-call psychiatrist determines that the child should come into the hospital, um, then the arrangements are made, um, and if the bed's available at Maryville, then the child comes over and really we look at it 
Um, the same way you would as if you were moving from the emergency room to a different floor of the hospital for a stay. You're moving to a hospital ward. A ward's a bad word for it, but that's the best comparison I can use um, at Maryville. And we've got a, a video that really kind of runs through the inpatient assessment program. Um, very well-qualified, well-spoken gentleman in the clip will walk you through it. So we can start that right now. The Rotary Home Mental Health Bed Program is an off-site at Windsor Regional Hospital that's located at Maryville Adolescent and Family Services. There's six beds that are operated by the hospital um, that we run here. Our goal in this program is to complete a thorough, comprehensive mental health assessment and to do that as efficiently as possible. And when we say efficient, we're looking at about three to seven days typically, although the length of stay can be really determined by our child and adolescent psychiatrist. Our statistical average is about eight days as a length of stay in this program. The mental health assessment is completed by a multidisciplinary team in our program. The key pieces or key players in that, in that program are the child and adolescent psychiatrists, the clinical psychologists, the social workers, the nurses, the child and youth workers, and the general practitioner. The child and adolescent psychiatrist is the key person as they determine when a child's ready for discharge and what type of treatment options best suit them. They complete a differential diagnosis based on patient interviews, family history and observations from childcare staff uh, that we see during the inpatient stay. The clinical psychologist is able to complete psychoeducational assessments and personality testing. Uh, more often than not, we'll do a psychological assessment in terms of intellectual and academic functioning. Personality testing is a little more rare and it's not typically information that we share with the school boards. Uh, the psychologist is also able to review any information that we acquire from the school board in terms of previous assessments, IEPs, uh, or things of that nature. On a day-to-day -day basis, the kids are going to spend their day really in a routine that we've created to try and replicate a normal environment for them. A big component of that is the school day. So beyond the first 24 hours where they need to stay in our building, they're going to attend our classroom, which is uh, run by a Greater Essex County District School Board teacher. And two of our child and youth workers are going to accompany the young people to the classroom and help them out through that part of their day. Typically, we'd ask uh, community schools to provide school work for the kids and that's part of the school liaison's uh, role is to communicate with the school around work and get things that might be relevant for the kids to keep up on while they're here. Uh, although really the focus of the school component here is to replicate uh, the routine of the school day. The academic expectations are not as important as a child's mental health uh, and overall functioning while they're here. Uh, in the evening they're going to spend a fair amount of time doing structured or semi-structured therapeutic activities with childcare staff. Our focus is on cognitive behavioral therapy and introducing ways to cope with depression, anxiety, or other stressors that these kids may be dealing with uh, outside of the program. There's also time for recreation. We have a gym, a pool, uh, a fair amount to do in the building uh, to keep kids busy through the evenings and we also encourage family visits at night. We're talking about an hour a day usually for family to visit and that can seem difficult at time for kids and family but again it goes into really getting the assessment done as quickly as possible so the more we see of the kids uh, the better. There are two social workers that work in the program and they serve as case managers here so they will take a detailed history from the family at the time of admission and then they're also going to serve really as the go-between for the family while their child is in the hospital uh, and they are also going to check in with the young people throughout their stay to get their input in terms of how they're feeling and what they'd like to see uh, on an ongoing basis from outpatient treatment. As this is a hospital, there's nursing staff here five days a week and on call 24-7 as we can get admissions at any point uh, through the day, just like you would see at the hospital. Uh, the nurses assess all of the hospital kids daily, um, vital signs, and just check in with them about how they're doing physically as well as how they're feeling uh, and where their mood is at uh, to give information both to the psychiatrist and the general practitioner. General practitioner is here two days a week uh, and assesses the hospital kids uh, from a physical standpoint to see how they're doing, if they're having any adverse reactions to medications and just their general well-being. The child and youth work staff are with the children really 24 hours a day in the program. They're able to supervise and support them through their routines of daily living 
a complete uh, assessment and rating scales for psychiatry as requested and really we're looking for their thoughts and observations on what they're seeing from the kids in terms of their social and emotional functioning uh, and well-being in this program.